There are few games for me that resonate so deeply from the get-go as I open the main menu. Probably because I feel old, or not young enough, or a few life-changing experiences too much, and probably because I am old, older. Okay, squad, listen up! Who subtle, unwavering trumpets accompanied by militaristic drum beats incite the dream Americana and overabundant patriotism which I am so fond of. You know, that good old one, World War II, the best generation of men and women ever who were eager to sacrifice themselves for a greater good we are mostly enjoying right now. And those after-school moments in a cheap basement gaming shop 20 years ago, my classmates fragging each other in Quake 3 or Unreal Tournament and me loading up a last save of Medal of Honor, a light assault. And I was storing my saves in a floppy disk. And I quit smoking just because of this game, because a pack of cigarettes was the equivalent of two hours of playtime. This retrospective is not going to be a very objective analysis, but I will try though and you can tell if I succeeded after going along until the end of this video. Let's get going, you look alive! Nor do I feel it should be objective, or any other retrospective nostalgia critique I may churn out if I feel like this passion project is worth it. I have such strong feelings for this game and most of its parts. Michael Giacchino soundtrack the most. I have a passion for games and all-encompassing nostalgia streaming through my body as of saying these words. I shed a tear, like right now, at this moment. I hope I do shed a tear when I'm recording this, to avoid being dishonest. Also, I smoke again. Of course. It probably helps me being a history aficionado, but the String Studio 2015 pulled on this one goes much, much deeper. From authentic, clever and engaging level design, except a couple of missions and expansion packs of course, to realistic weapons, a marvelous ping of M1 Garand reload and unexpectedly alluring shell of a story of the main campaign. What makes it special, more than the sum of its mostly excellent parts, is that Allied Assault carries within a soul worth exploring if you just let yourself go deep into somewhat unrealistic, bravado frantic depiction of World War II warfare. At the same time, after replaying the whole War Chest compilation, including both expansion packs Sparehead and Breakthrough, I can say that 60% of my fascination for this game comes stemming from nostalgia, my brain playing tricks on me, of those good old times when a powerful enough PC at home was a dream. But is what remains besides my nostalgia enough to call this game or compilation a quality game worth revisiting after 20 years, a full generation of mankind? There are three words that can summarize it, the good, the bad and the ugly. And by good I mean great. Let's start with the music. Just listen to this, man! As I entered the first rundown country cottage in Battle of the Bacage level, a shiver started coming down the back of my neck. The composition is slow, melancholic, methodical, just as you kindly bullet sponge every nasty baby boy room after room. The feeling overcomes you with atmosphere and some kind of nostalgic historical emotion. Despite the lackluster graphics, no aim down sight, I still feel it and I can't let go of a motion of sweet sadness. Behind enemy lines, another wonderful mission accompanied by a spectacular music track.
damn that stupid dog! The urgency, the pressure of one man infiltrating heavily defended military barracks and sabotaging railroads along the way. In some sense, this exact mission would be considered outrageous by today's standards and would probably be made as a stealthy one. It does not make sense, but it doesn't matter once you hear the calling sound of wreaking havoc. Now this one, Day of the Tiger mission. What a cool mission name, by the way. The track is playful, a little silly maybe, but it instills such a historically flavorful feeling of courageousness, bravado and adventurousness that I can't stop but feel the urge to obliterate and crush some Nazi scumass. To rush forward through the Normandy trenches with your pals into places unseen and unknown. And what the hell is this? A real stealth level, return to four. And by stealth, I mean the moan's bare bonesy, archaic stealth put to shame by the likes of Thief released a few years earlier. I hate not the composition, which is great, but the decision to place this track on a stealth level. It does not fit here at all and is the only instance where I am mortified by the placement, not the wonderful track itself. It fits again very well once you get the prize of the level, the new secret submachine gun. Now, I know a large part of Medal of Honor Allied Assault soundtrack came from the previous Medal of Honor releases on console, but who cares? I, for one, do not. I play PC single player only and Allied Assault was my first love of the FPS world. I am also sure those players who had to listen to the old tracks again did not object. The soundtrack alone elevates this 21 years old game to the point of likability despite lackluster graphics and somewhat repeatable or mediocre last two levels in the main campaign. It elevates the first few missions to greatness, as the level and mission design, sound and overall immersion is excellent. Also, as I said, my nostalgia meter is on high right now, so take it with a little tiny grain of salt. And it does not elevate the expansion packs that much to make them likable, those poor bastard things. I try to imagine what if this game wouldn't have an orchestral soundtrack, you know, just an abysmal, cheap electric one or just ambient and explosion sounds. It would make the first few excellent missions just average in today's standards, the last few missions barely playable and expansion sadistic. No other FPS to date except the new generation of Dooms has achieved such a level of blending the soundtrack with the idea of the game and making it an inseparable part as just listening to the first few chords booting the game instantly triggers the emotion. Music in this game is a feeling, an emotion, and the game is the music. Of course, there are a few hiccups in the music design. Most, but not all of the tracks, are overly dramatic and adventurous and it does not fit in some of the stealth levels perfectly, breaking the balance and flow of the gameplay as showing your papers to a Nazi guard while listening to a bombastic score in Fort Schmerzen seems like an overkill. It seems the main game campaign does have an issue with having too much stealth levels and not enough calm, underlyingly insidious themes to be used as a music backdrop as the designers had either to use them all or repeat some tracks again and again which would have caused an issue of over listening and getting tired late in the game. Especially the start of Return to Fort Smerton and scuttling the U-529. Removing music altogether and placing you alone against the calm elements of winter season. Just listen to this.
There is nothing, no music at all, just a calm, snowy winter air rustling through the pine trees and that is enough. There is, of course, the original track made by Michael Giacchino for Mission Operation Overlord, especially level the rescue mission. By the way, we, the gamers, had him before any Grammy, Academy, Emmy, Golden Globe and BAFTA. We had him before he was famous and witnessed his talent before those silly moviegoers did. His music was paving the way for the games to use expensive full orchestra recording setups and it shows. Anyway, back to the case. The track called North Africa kicks in and provides a beautiful blend of North African atmosphere and World War II warfare in those times. You almost get caught whistling the tune in your head because, of course, I do not know how to whistle, but that's my problem, I guess. It is not so bombastic, but maintains the same level of ambitiousness and steadfast sweetness. That brings us to the excellent sound design, even in the expansions by the way. The ambient sound is excellent and can stand on its own when a specific situation in the level demands it. I already mentioned the opening of Fort Smerton. Here is the opening of scuttling the U-529. The same simple, minimal ambient sound. Of course, some nostalgia kicking in hearing the last words uttered by Major Grillo through a radio and I cannot think of a better setup. It was excellent 20 years ago and it still retains the same greatness in overall design choices now. I'm now standing in front of the window. You should be able to see me through the scope. Or another example. Level Sniper's Last Stand, in my opinion, an undeservedly infamous level in the Day of the Tiger mission. <laughs> the rain, the air, the slamming, dank shutters, the collision of rainy, foggy, muddy particles together are all perfectly delivered and adds to the overall picture of the stressful, dreadful feeling as you step in Lieutenant Mike Powell's boots in a nightmarishly depicted abandoned small town in Brittany, and the occasional sniper gun shooting in the distance. It is wonderful. It is anticlimactic. It is perfect in all senses despite the 100% accuracy of baby boy enemy snipers. Soundtrack in this mission, for me, elevates it from a rather sluggish, somewhat too painfully realistic World War II sniper simulator into a legendary gaming moment by Battle of Attrition. Of course, we can't miss Omaha Beach level. The level so good it got blatantly and infamously plagiarized by no one else but Steven Spielberg in Saving Private Ryan and also Medal of Honor copycat Call of Duty in its World War II iteration released in 2017. So, there is no music in the first part of the level at all. You are thrown away and given the opportunity to experience the reality of war just listening to a cacophony of MG42 rounds whistling past your ears. Waves crashing against your barge and your fellow friend galloping through the mud and screaming through the agony of pushing forward. What a feat, both of those soldiers who fought valiantly and designers who made it into a video game. Go, go. Much can be said about guns in general and their sounds too. This is a classic. You cannot reload M1 Garand mid-clip. At first, I remember thinking what a shit weapon. Until I heard the ping. It is my favorite weapon here and the noise it makes, the painstakingly accurate reload animation. 
Not that I know much about guns, but let's assume I do, you silly boys! The dull shooting sound is etched into my mind as one of the greatest personal gaming memories in a tie for third place along with jerking off in leisure suit lorry. And the German guns! MP40 comes with a sonorous thud and screaming finish. I remember it 20 years later. Later in the game you get to use mostly German alternatives as a soldier behind enemy lines and it never gets boring. The reload animation for MP40 feels so real and painful on Lieutenant Powell's palms you can almost feel the numbness of your index finger. And the king of assault weapons in this game, basically a full-fledged machine gun in power. Both in-game hit points and a bunch of a sound that it makes feels and sounds glorious. That moment of getting it for the first time as a prototype weapon from a secret Nazi research facility and when you start running back outside mowing down wave after wave of those Nazi baby boys running at you is priceless. I would say the voice quality is ranging from ok to good, but there is one huge caveat. The Germans are strictly speaking German. I do not remember lots of games especially first-person shooters not being afraid to use other languages without even a subtitle. They speak German not only in occasional war cry or painful expressions, but you can catch them having a conversation from time to time, and you have no idea what they're talking about. Just listen to this. Not that one, sorry. Did you understand anything from this round of cards of the notorious Nazi card game? I suspect Hitler is the queen of hearts, yes? Yes, 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 yes. Of course you did not. Unless you speak German, but considering the minuscule number of views I expect from this project, it is highly unlikely. You are Lieutenant Powell, an American. You have no idea what they are talking about. Maybe they are commenting on your nerdy beard and forward-leaning posture, or maybe one of them just had a bad day in a public shower, or maybe they are discussing your nice fond ass. You do not know, you just press forward expecting the worst they can deliver. The voiceovers are nice, I wouldn't say they are exceptionally well recorded or deliver a range of emotion, but there are almost no instances where they are given a chance as most of the script, if you can call it like that, is random battle encounters and war cries or just two Nazi thugs complimenting your ass. So, we have moved the key component of Allied Assault success out of the way. We can discuss some lesser things. Medal of Honor Allied Assault, when it came out in 2002, was probably the first shooter to avoid comparisons with Half-Life. It paved the way for a new era of great World War II shooters and shooters in general that applied a little more nuanced, realistic, slower way of playing. The main difference is, and that was a bummer to me at first, was its set-piece design. There is no story per se, just a script and lots of scripted pieces connecting the smaller levels but not the missions. I remember playing this 20 years ago and wondering who Lieutenant Powell is, how he feels, what he thinks, what are his morals, values and life before the war. There is nothing to deepen the understanding of your character as the only glimpses of it being a brief one-way interaction during a loading screen. Portrayed as Powell's superior officer's official letter of order, bringing almost no sense of familiarity or personality. This is it, Lieutenant. Our first large-scale offensive of the war. I guess we managed to accept this formula as a market standard. 
as hard as it may be a dumbed down version of storytelling and it mostly stuck with us in the Call of Duty genre except maybe a few memorable instances in later Call of Duty games, Black Ops and World at War, those set pieces connect the dots between the objectives in the level, mostly, and add directed action in simple soldier life storytelling. Everyone remembers the first drive inside a stolen truck before the Jerry roadblock? Just look at the direction, notice how the captain turns off the lantern before stopping. Don't give your position away. Advance some cover and check the corners. Everyone keep quiet. This is better work. Of that moment when you hear the door. What was that? I think I heard something. And you check the door and the moment after you are ambushed with MG42 and seconds later get to experience this machine gun in all its glory for yourself. Just as the designers perfectly orchestrated to let you cut down enemies coming out of all possible doors, windows and corners. Or that U-boat mission start as you get your trusty Springfield rifle and look down the scope as you see Major Grill waving through the window. Later on heroically, albeit comically, single-handedly opening the gates for you and dying a hero's death before being torn to shreds by mongrel dogs and submachine gun fire. Or those two minutes of spearhead expansion pack just after you jump out of a hit and burning plane. A perfect example of a set piece that sets the tone and should keep the bar high between closing your objectives. It comes with a caveat though, especially when quick reload comes into play. Even now, after 20 years, I remember some scripted events to the last detail and this speaks greatly about the level of design and work that was put into it. But playing along and, in some hard sequences, reloading a saved game for a few times in a row greatly shows how much script has been put into place. Even the non-eventful, no dialogue containing sequences has so many scripted deaths and NPC behavior you couldn't stop but notice the same NPC hurrying into the exact same spot in the foxhole and blazing a full round at the same enemy soldier in the same place. This isn't that big of a deal breaker, but sometimes you just notice and it breaks your immersion for a short while. There is one instance where overall game flow seems not to be scripted that much and that is Sniper Town level. Where you lead your squad and they respond to your taken path, follow wherever you go, your medic gives you your hourly dose of Xanax whenever you need it, but Again, they cover places as kind of predetermined and they seem to stick behind same pile of rubble or take a dump behind the same bush and so on. I'll be right behind. Overall, as me and most of you would replay this game one time only, this doesn't pose a problem or poison your enjoyment. Too bad the rest of Spearhead didn't have much further interest to make that investment in designing the set pieces worthwhile of immersion and attention. The set pieces are not everything though. This game managed to maintain a high level of immersion through its atmosphere and continuous interaction. Starting from the small things, the legendary opening in a war room and that shady fan spinning in the corner to unforgettable main menu music accompanied by fitting, bland and one-sided briefings. Also, some really small things like a shootable searchlight with swarms of flies or completely simulated barrel liquid physics. Shooting the spotlights will get their attention. It's best to just avoid them. Or a full visualization of the bullets left in your clip, running out one by one. Did you know that if you shoot a barrel, it only runs out until the hole you made is reached? 
if you shoot it again, you can still drain it until it dries if you shoot it at the bottom. And the more holes you make, the faster the gas runs out. These are ridiculous touches in a game made in 2002 and the best Call of Duty managed was Fish and Dog AI. Also, the medals that you actually receive by participating in the sequences and completing the objectives, which are mostly not entirely clear to begin with, raises the bar of level of participation and active effort the player needs to make to find and complete said objective. Your current objective is highlighted in yellow. Now, notice that the arrow on your compass is pointing at one of the towers. For example, in Algeria, you just get a notice of another allied POW being interrogated in the other room through the grate at the top of the wall. Everything is a part of a design goal to immerse you in a classic war drama. You can successfully complete the mission and move on, but those moments you hear and know something else is happening besides the main objective makes you search immerse and actively qualify for the medal by looking around every corner and corridor. Save my life, sir. The set pieces initially prepare and entangle. The atmosphere, impacted hugely by excellent mission and level design, along with the music, retains that drama and sucks you in as an episode of Band of Brothers. The big positive, except the last level possibly, is the variety of mission it takes and the tone of the mission sets them far apart from each other so that you do not feel bored to death or rushing through every room mowing down every Nazi without satisfaction to get to the end. Until the last winter levels, you feel entangled and attached to your character and you do not even feel impersonating Lieutenant Mike Powell anymore. You are yourself imitating and fantasizing being on the battlefield. Level variety comes in already mentioned visual design choices, perfectly created with what designers had at that time. Combined with music, perfect gun animations and sound, entangling set piece sequence after sequence, this makes for a perfect soup of milk, peas and carrots. Also, the level assignment variety offers you all sniper levels, stealthy infiltration levels, all out massive frontline attacks, turret sections which completely lost its fun for being absolutely overused in expansions. You get accompanied by your squad mates from time to time who are completely disposable either by enemy fire or scripted out. But despite actually being a one man army, I still feel the urge to push and shout with a nerdy, unconfident, albeit silent hurrah, with a frontline attack of incomprehensible horror and because of this silly shooting match face to face with the Hitlerite baby boys. Even solo, you feel enamored and though completely unrealistic, although you can actually find a few cases of a one-man soldier devastating a whole armored platoon, you believe you are there and live inside the script of mainly nothing but the atmosphere. Some can be said about the quick save system. I generally hate the modern day saving checkpoint system, although from a perspective it is a simple and convenient thing to consider, the level of control it gives you is unprecedented. Maybe I am just an insecure quicksave cuck, but for some reason I like it. I like being in control and that means I am not such a cuck anymore. Those moments of saving at the last drop of a blood just seconds before dying is unforgettable and Okay, to some point I agree to a level of criticism pointed out at the difficulty. In some cases, the scripted scenes do pose a threat to make your sticky keyboard suffer much more humiliating times than it is used to. Omaha, for example. Especially if you get caught in gunfire in a foxhole and your squad mates are rushing in and blocking your path at the same time. Or that moment when you are forced to traverse a field completely covered in machine gun fire by two Nazi BABY BOYS who are coming in from an immeasurable pool of BABY BOYS.
guess once you manage to snipe them, there are no options left. Anyways, and there are sideways lurking so joyfully that you look at them as a mirage and expect that random chance lets you through as it would like in real life and the path to cover looks so short. Just a couple of wide shaky leg gems for such a manly man like Lieutenant Powell and you should be okay? No. You are cut down mercilessly with almost no time to shoot back. And you push back forward inch by inch, slowly positioning yourself for an opportunity to shoot those sons of baby boys in the face with one bullet and manage to get to safety after a tiresome 43 minutes of moving 50 feet and pressing a reload button for 78 times. There are a handful of moments like this in a game and I understand some frustration. For me though, I am frustrated and satisfied at the same time. Maybe it's just me, or maybe I miss those good old days of the early 2000s gaming culture. One very important notice though. Sniper level is glorious. I already mentioned the atmosphere that you are overtaken with and the 100% enemy sniper accuracy sometimes makes you use that holy quick save and quick load procedure often, but it perfectly fits into the setting. It is realistic. What is not realistic is that you wouldn't die immediately or all over in pain and in an incapacitating state, but I am not smart enough to admit that I care or that this last sentence does make any sense. And it gets even better once you find your squad mates and are given the objective to keep some of them alive. And they actively participate in battle, make cover maneuvers, medic automatically gives out free paracetamol and you push through the city into the prize of the mission, the King Tiger Tank. As your friends get shot, you almost feel the pain and load the last quick save to counter that and push out your dumb bastard mates out of the way. Aside from those infrequent but few moments of quick load frenzy, the game is not that difficult. You learn to adapt and check your corners or walk, not run into an open area before making sure you are not overwhelmed by enemy fire. You can easily fall into a trap and it is possible to lose most if not all of your vitality by getting struck face to face with even one enemy grunt, but if you salvage just one threat in your homer's brain, you should be fine at least on medium. There is no recovering health and there are clear obstacles in every level as an expectation set by designers to challenge yourself and achieve what is expected of you. Enemies, although quite clearly, sometimes have a line of sight of a cuckoo and the hearing as vivid as a wild boar are not exactly dumb enough to charge headfirst into battle. They run from your grenades, they peek around the corners with their little baby boy heads and helmets, they show at least a basic level of squad AI, they even manage to shoot at you behind cover blindly, peeking with their gun and shooting at the approximate direction where you were a second ago. It is mildly challenging, but nothing to be afraid of for an average player. I see small hiccups though, while your enemies can be prone, which makes them quite difficult to hit in a frenzy of a battle, you cannot for some reason. I am sure this is not an engine limitation, as you see, you can crouch, which makes no sense, and there is no usability for this feature except the training level. Special mention goes to stealth. I could even say there is an emphasis on stealth in some missions, but it looks to be included as an afterthought. It is silly, actually. You could make a distinction between stealth levels or small parts of it pretending you need to move silently and slowly. The ones you stroll around Nazi bases in a stolen Nazi designer uniform brandishing legally obtained passports, or as the game calls it, papers. Can I bitte Ihre Papiere sehen? Those are dumbass shit from the outlook, but the presentation and the aura of those set pieces somehow maintains the curiosity. Those moments just listening to German gibberish or playing cards give it a genuine feeling of everyday Nazi base site living. It makes those instances curious, if nevertheless so stupid. You basically have nothing else to do than walk around to your next objective and push a specific bind key for show papers. That's it.
the other stealth segments are actual stealth where you are expected to actually walk slowly, not run around like an ostrich blazing guns. Oh, and you are actually given a silenced pistol to accompany in your stealthy endeavors. And those segments suck stealth-wise. Or maybe I do. Suck. I mean, but as many times as I tried, it just doesn't work and it feels completely not designed to be played this way. Hey, that's a spider! If there is more than one enemy in the field, you're busted. Even if you shoot him in the head, the other one will notice like a chipmunk and run over to sound the alarm and shoot back at you. Nothing works, at least for me. I tried gun butting too, same thing. It seems NPCs are not programmed to notice the difference between a loud gunshot and a silenced pistol. There is no way of knowing how visible you are. In some cases, you can explode your trusty shotgun into someone's melon head without his boyfriend noticing 10 feet apart. It is really a mess and a shame designers implemented those stealth simulation levels at all. Well... It doesn't really matter anyways, because you are always welcome to just rush forward without any remorse about your previous life choices and future, kill a few Nazi bastards with a silent pistol, until you get to the point where you get a new gun and move over clearing out the place. You still get that same sense of all I the soul gameplay, even if it was a pretend stealth level at the start, nothing mattered. It is still good, even those alarms triggered every 25 seconds give you additional opportunity for a challenge and more chaotic gameplay by not pretending to be in a stealth level that pretends to be stealthy. So one of those rare examples where bad game mechanics does not actually matter if you do not try to follow suit and just play as you should be with glamour and bombast. There is no point in arguing that Medal of Honor Ally the Salt is, in essence, a run-and-gun shooter, and a very good one. Mostly perfectly orchestrated anarchy that creates the sense of immersion in the environment. Despite lackluster graphics, lackluster in technical, not artistic way, I must say, the overall package still retains a natural flow of gameplay, maintaining the pace and urgency of an arcade shooter, but with a sense of superb atmosphere. The novelty of nostalgia wears off after the first replay, as it should be, especially after playing through the expansions, breakthrough the most. Despite a whole generation of persons born and growing up into puberty during these years, it was still worthwhile revisiting this game. I must admit, as I said, around 60% of this is coming as nostalgia of the good old times, but despite this, this game still retains a lot of quality components that made it great in 2002. Now, let's delve into the expansions. You could not separate Spearhead from its opening scene. It is glorious, and actually, the novelty hasn't worn off that much even after 21 years. It still somehow shakes you up and returns to that grisly feeling of World War II pirate trooper. 
The sensation is palpable, but the novelty starts to shake off right after you land in a chicken shit barn. They still manage to add a bunch of new guns and model them flawlessly, each of the new weapons behaving with distinction in sound, animation, look and feel. Especially kudos to more exotic variants like SVT-40, German Gewehr 43 or British Weblay Revolver. There is no single new music track, most reused from original, the rest few even from previous installments. Even some parts of level design and objectives are reused. For example, there is a quite similar foxhole jumping arcade level in the Ardennes level called Battle of the Bulge, as we already did in the main game Omaha level. Thanks for the weapons and the chow. Hey Shaney, how dick you think Jerry's gonna be when they hear their supplies got hijacked? <laughs> And the same abandoned and craggy town assault, this time in a T-34 tank, for some reason operated by a British soldier Jack Barnes. It feels like a retread. It manages to capture just a glimpse of main game success and immersion despite overall technical design and technical quality. Well, maybe just a few specs, usually at the start of each mission, followed by a handful of strenuous moments of boredom and indifference. It feels like a shell of a main game, and this feeling never lets you go until the end. The level design is shallow too. Maybe the second mission Battle of the Bulge gives out a sense of limited freedom and a little of that main game's winter warfare atmosphere, but the clumsiness of your forthcoming adventure through the frozen woods leaves you unsatisfied and disappointed. In some cases, there are literally empty fields of nothingness of the Dutch lands with small one-legged witch shacks dotting the agonizingly bleak grey landscape. And here is the main boss of the Neptune mission, some kind of German general, very dramatic. Well done. I'll meet you at the front of the house. Good work. Let's move out. Even the Berlin mission, which was an opportunity to get back to the grandiose, is a slog to finish. Do you remember shock drooping the Reichstag in the first Call of Duty? Now that was mesmerizing. The battle for Berlin in Medal of Honor feels like shallow space and forces you into depression like salt water, you being stranded on an uninhabited island. It was lauded by the time it was released as a good, above-average expansion, some even said it is better than the original and improves almost on every aspect of the main game. BULLSHIT! Aside from cinematic opening, the proud inclusion of volumetric smoke effects, which was proudly used one time as a finish-off of an opening scene and forgotten altogether to use in any visual or gameplay mechanics perspective, there is nothing else to greatly enjoy in Spearhead. The initial opening sequence shortly transfers into a slog. The Ardennes mission is an average interpretation of the return to Fort Smertsen, and that closing mission of the main campaign in Allied Assault was not one of the great ones to say the least. And the last one in Berlin is an uninspired festival of sadness. Overall, since I finished off the main game campaign on a much higher note, albeit not optimal one due to the last level being not great, and riding on that nostalgia carousel helped me maintain the interest, but nothing more. If you are a war history aficionado, I would still recommend playing it to get your average share of World War II shooting gaming nostalgia. Since the main campaign of the expansion is only 3 hours long, your time won't be wasted. Solid in the trenches, Barnes. The CP is anxiously waiting for those documents. Get back here ASAP. Godspeed, Sergeant. Over and out. Ah, 
Breakthrough, the third installment in the Allied Assault franchise, the pinnacle of World War II FPS evolution. It makes me shiver and feel unpassionate upon myself, as if I was conned again and sold an unplayable fake Chinese Sega console bought with money I got from my great-grandmother 27 years ago. I was milking cows for her that whole summer spanning a frustrating palette of 11 levels and a prolonged length of playtime of around 8 to 9 hours. Breakthrough is a misstep in level and overall game design on most fronts possible. It is a huge step down to the bowels of shite and a disappointment and downgrade from previous expansion spearhead on all aspects. At least this expansion manages to open up a new front in a historical sense. You get an opportunity to witness the Allied invasion in Sicily and mainland Italy enjoying a daily routine sparring with fellow unbeatable Italian supermen. That makes the last two missions actually a one giant pile of smelly gland secretion or one long slog through an Italian rubble of war. The expansion locales are bland and uninvited. At least, in theory, you get back to Africa and visit some Tunisian deserts, leading the way in some of the more strangely designed assaults in this game. If you could say Spearhead offered a bland version of Allied Assault Campaign and was somewhat bearable with notable moments that elevated the overall enjoyment a bit, Breakthrough almost entirely resembles a shell of an Allied Assault clone that bears little resemblance to the original as far as the tone and feel of the game goes. I could probably note one mediocre instance where it gets semi-interesting. The German boat bombing run, which gets boring almost immediately after you board the ship with a stolen, again, officer's uniform and showing papers for a fifth time is the best entertainment you get, as also is the escape sequence which, at first, gets you at last motivated that something a little original has happened, which is over too quickly too soon, and the mechanics of running away from a sunken ship is cumbersome, mostly due to engine limitations at that time. The other thing, and in most cases a few of the moments that make this expansion at least somewhat enjoyable at least for a few minutes are so bad that it's good, silly and laugh out loud camaraderie moments of bravado and cinematic scripts. Like the tram train gun sequence, putting you on a short ride through a heavily fortified area which is so agonizingly boring, tedious and irritating, add to that bland and recycled visual style and a comically slow ride. Just imagine yourself riding that cart all honky-dory and reloading a save each 5 seconds trying to pinpoint a direction of enemy placement to preemptively destroy them, and those enemies know in advance where you are. What a Nazi-inspired BABY BOY rump! You might say, well, if you say or comment anything at all, because I expect at least like 5 views for this video, 4 of them mine, but you stupid banana with spider X sniper town level in Allied Assault main game was exactly the same and you said it is legendary. No, my dear imaginable viewer. Sniper Town was a masterclass in atmospheric world building and storytelling without much of a script. A personified Springfield skew feeling of World War II sniper warfare at its most authentic and best. Breakthrough is empty, shallow and bland not supported either by the quality of scripted events nor wonderful sound design. For that matter, this expansion seems to be broken by poor design too. And it makes those laughable sequences frustratingly laughable, laughably frustrating and somewhat unexpectedly enjoyable. In a Tunisia mission, you are accompanied on a scripted stealth objective to infiltrate a Nazi ship docks with a German fellow named Klaus. You're Sergeant Baker, no? 
at one point it goes wrong and you are forced into a rooftop chase and Klaus gives you an exact 30 seconds estimation it will take him to unlock the door to escape. Well, Klaus says, Klaus knows. Regardless of his poor skills of telling his own fortune, it never takes 30 seconds as you are forced to deflect wave after wave of German submachine gunners and grenades for at least 3 minutes. I try to prolong this section as much as possible and he never opens the door until you clear out all enemies struggling to save the last drops of your ammunition. The door is locked! Scheiße! Hold him off! I need 30 seconds! Oh, poor Klaus. What a poor Santa Claus you would be. As a history lover, and yes, I make love to history, the rare thing that I loved are guns. Specifically, Italian guns inclusion. It retains the same level of great detail, sound design and animation. This does not help in any way to improve the situation, but manages to at least instill a melancholic emotion for those of us who care. This expansion is in some cases extremely hard even on medium difficulty, some by design, because of stupid gameplay decisions, some by utterly bad design and an absolutely missing testing procedure at the developing stage. For example, for some reason they thought that they needed to increase the difficulty of rescuing the British POWs from a prison level by removing almost all ammunition besides what you get at the starting point of the level. You might as well drown yourself by jumping off that rowing boat rather than try pushing through the level to the end. You are left to use your pointy secondary gun and a pistol because even when enemies drop dead they do not drop the ammunition like at all. You are forced to roam through every corner breaking the flow of the game and please keep in mind that you need to survive that onslaught with Santa Claus picking the lock. It doesn't break my heart to say that this expansion is terrible. It lacks passion, new level theme additions and new locales feel like a retreat despite being new. Great Guns does not help besides tickling your armchair historian spot. It's too long because it is bad, not because it is prolonged. It was a mistake to release it and I would have happily accepted a decent expansion even though it was surrounded by other first class World War II shooters. Because overall I cannot get enough of them and I mourn those times when World War II was a prominent subgender at the start of the century. I wouldn't say you should definitely avoid it if you are a Medal of Honor fan, but if you miss it I wouldn't blame you at all. This expansion is not worthy of the Medal of Honor title on its box. The War Chest compilation of the main game and both expansions is a steal if you wishlist it and buy it on discount. I got mine for $2. Even if you did not play it by the time it got released or ever, I am pretty sure you will be amazed on how cinematic shooters managed to be in the early 2000s. You will admire the music, guns, set pieces, sound and level design, overall atmosphere and tone of the game. It is a marvel to behold and a brilliant example of gaming history as the game that pushed FPS evolution by inspiring other games that came later. If you are a returning player be sure to repeat it every few years and I am sure some of you did already. You would probably be somewhat satisfied with Spearhead expansion but get bored by the end of it. I am not even mentioning Breakthrough. Next time I am replaying I am just sticking to the main game. So this is it. 
My story is over, at least for this game. I feel strange having finally finished it and I am not sure what to think of it or where this road will lead me, if anywhere. I have a passion for video games and an early outlook on older games. I collect them. My dream is to have a big library of older games at least to be discussed and talked about. I think I may go on for an additional video or two but it took me such an effort and precious time to complete that I know I wouldn't be able to keep at it for a very long time. To be honest, I keep my expectations low and probably the largest portion of my views, if any, will be from myself and my few friends. At the same time as making this video and having an enormous satisfaction, I had quite a few almost sleepless nights, I had to bargain my free time with my 7 year old daughter and miss some opportunities to meet my family and friends. I enjoyed making this video, but I am sure I will not be able to sustain this passion without the views and possibly some support from your side. I am very happy if you are a legitimate viewer and added your number to my view count, that means a lot. I hope you liked it. My thoughts currently are, I will make additional videos on some other games that were released longer than one human generation ago, at least 20 years. Possibly the first Max Payne or Rise of Nations and see how my channel fares. If, by some miracle, I get at least a few thousand views and subscribers and see a clearer road ahead of me, I might get motivated and create some more. If not, I guess I will be sad and feel lonely that my passion or the methods or quality of the videos is not enough to facilitate your admiration. Unfortunately, I have to live my daily life and struggle for survival as all of you do. And if this project does not give me any motivation, I will leave it to dust until YouTube inevitably succumbs to the sands of time. If you liked what I made, I am satisfied enough. That means a lot to me. Thank you, kind viewer. If you feel you would like to hear more from me, you are welcome to subscribe and like this video to help me qualify for a partner program. And hopefully try to further pursue the goal of my dreams to make it kind of a side job that would give me enough motivation to keep making these videos. If you feel you like it enough that you may even spend your hard earned cash I have also opened a Patreon account with benefits, which can also help me achieve my dream of reminding you of great games of your gaming pastime. Thank you, my friends. Best of luck to you. Be good.